Hello friends, my name is Susie Lytle. I'm an interpretive naturalist with the Forest Preserve District of Will County. And on this episode, we're gonna head back to Lake Renwick, Heron Rookery to get an up close look at the island. Then we're gonna fly over to Plum Creek Nature Center to get winter bird feeding 101. And then we'll roll up our sleeves to help out the state endangered Blanding's turtles. So are you ready to reconnect with nature on this episode of The Buzz? We're back at Lake Renwick Heron Rookery. Now, if you remember from the first episode of The Buzz, this place was bustling with birds. From March to mid-August, this access point is closed for the nesting season of herons, egrets, and cormorants. But now that the season's over, we're back to give you an insider view of what goes on on that island. You can tell I got my life jacket on, I have my paddle. We're gonna kayak out there for a closer look. Now we got special permission because kayaking is not permitted on this preserve, nor highly recommended in the middle of December. But we are dedicated to get you out there to see never before sights. Now Rookery is a colony of nesting birds. In our case, this includes great blue herons, black crowned night herons, great egrets, and the double crested cormorants. It's beneficial for these birds to nest all together to keep an eye out for predators. Usually this is done in trees, and on our site we've logged about 1,200 to 1,500 birds. So you can imagine that takes a big toll on the trees. And it's natural for these rookeries to nest in one area, wear out a habitat, and move on. So when the Forest Reserve saw that our trees were taking a beating, we stepped in and built these structures. From the shore, it looks like one long island. But now that we paddled out here, you can see that there's two separate islands with multiple structures on both. We've now arrived on the island. We're stepping over nests and getting a closer look at what these platforms are really made of. There are two rounds of construction out on the island. First, there are simple square boxes uh, and telephone poles, which we still see the telephone poles today. And their goal is to border the island, keeping erosion in check. The second round were these platforms that we see today. So they were designed by our natural resources management supervisor to mimic a stand of trees. And you'll also notice these metal posts attached to the platforms. There's large branches stuck in there to simulate that tree design, but also provide more nesting opportunities. The nesting spots were guided by observations made by the birds' behaviors. After gaining permission from the Illinois Nature Preserve Commission, construction took about six months in between nesting season. They used a pontoon boat to bring over the materials from the mainland to these islands. The pontoon boat was converted to more of a barge and even prepped to break through thin ice during the winter months. Once on the island, a bobcat came to put down stones and install the big vertical beams. After that, it was up to workers to climb all over to finish installation. Maintenance on the structure is pretty minimal. Over the years, we may have fixed a frame or two, but overall it holds up pretty well. What needs maintenance are these nests. The birds come back and they don't necessarily use the same nest, but rebuild or build on top of the old ones. So you'll see behind me, these nests are like stacked up on each year that they've been added to. You can almost count how many years this nest has been used. Investigating this nest, it looks like there's at least six layers of new nests built on top. And it looks like it's made out of sticks, plant fiber, mud. Uh, there's also some man-made materials in here, so they're being pretty resourceful. And I know you can't smell anything, but I smell a lot of bird poop in here. So I'm sure that helps it stick together. So on the ground, it's covered with a lot of loose sticks. These are from the nests that don't really stick together. With all the wind that blows out here, they fall apart or fall out of the trees or on the platforms. So there's plenty of new nesting materials to be brought in and patched back together. Another human impact we're seeing out here is fishing line. This nest has a whole pile of fishing line in there. It's really sad to see because even in its nesting season, we've seen birds caught in it and end up dying because of this line. So please be responsible, pack out your line or dispose of it in our receptacles that are throughout our preserves. Another surprise we're finding out here on the island is a lot of bones, skulls, and full-on skeletons. Uh, this is probably from the predators. Like I mentioned, these birds nest together to keep an eye out 
for those things that want to eat them. So around the island is all water. So that protects them from raccoons and coyotes, but it does not protect them from things above. Great horned owls, hawks, and bald eagles will come and take these birds. So my guess is that all these remains are from those bald eagles that are a little hungry. Remember, we saw one last time we visited here. When the preserve is closed for nesting season, the public can still visit by going to limited public programs and guided bird viewing. Now when you come out here, you're going to see tons of herons and egrets and cormorants, and they like to nest at different levels. So at the tippy top are the herons, in the middle tend to be the cormorants, and at the bottom are the egrets. Now come mid-August, the preserve opens up for general use. And winter is still a great time to come out here because even though the nesting birds are gone, historically we've seen lots of other wildlife use these platforms. We've seen bald eagles, great horned owls, swans, and tons of different waterfalls swimming around the lake. Lake Renwick has transformed over the years from a recreational getaway to a bird sanctuary. Today we highlight the birds that call this place a home. This rookery is the reason why this preserve is an Illinois nature preserve. We're not sure what the birds would have done without these platforms. They could have nested in different trees on this land or abandoned the preserve altogether. But luckily these structures are built strong to keep that habitat lasting for many years to come. Winter is in full swing. Beat that cabin fever by embracing it and eating up everything the season has to offer. There's no shortage of wildlife to see when you take it slow. Or pick up the pace and let your furry friends run wild at one of six dog parks. Hit our sled hill and brace yourself for glorious wipeouts. Find a spot to enjoy a moment of winter's end. You can also give snowshoeing a shot. Or maybe cross-country skiing is more your thing. The choice is yours. Here's some ways to lure birds right into your own backyard. stir crazy at home? Well, I've got a great activity that brings nature right to your window. Winter is a great time to get into bird feeding. So you can be as easy as a pine cone feeder dipped in peanut butter and seed to create a full-on sanctuary like this one. We're here at Plum Creek Nature Center with program coordinator Bob Brierton, who has put his heart and soul in creating the perfect area to feed the birds. Feeding birds is one of the easiest ways to bring nature right into your backyard and get a close-up look at it. And also, by having birds around, you're going to have bird song around, so you're going to have a, not only are you going to have a visual experience, you'll have the audio experience as well of the nature sound. That's really great. Now, I thought we weren't supposed to feed wild animals, so why is it good to feed birds? Well, birds look for food in a lot of different places normally. They don't ever usually have one spot, so they travel all over looking for birds. So your feeder area is just one location that the birds might use. Since they don't rely on it and don't uh, come to the same spot over and over all the time, um, feeding birds isn't as much of an issue as it is with other wild animals. In our bird sanctuary, we have lots of different feeders that have different seed for different kinds of birds. So Bob, how about you walk us through the different feeders and what they attract? So we use several varieties of feeders and situations to, to attract different birds because different birds feed differently and will eat different seeds. So this feeder here is a tube feeder. Um, birds that cling like finches, chickadees, nuthatches, all are, are comfortable with this style of feeder. And the seed that we use in this one is oil sunflower seed. It's a black sunflower seed that is, attracts probably the widest variety of birds. A lot of tree perching birds like that oil sunflower seed and will come to it. It's a really good, feed, it's a really good general feeder to use just to attract a wide variety of birds. So this feeder is uh, designed for blue jays in particular. They really like this feeder a lot and will use it pretty regularly. Also, tufted titmice will come to this feeder. 
uh, and use it a lot and some woodpeckers will come and use it too but really it's it's mainly designed for the blue jays and we and if you want blue jays this is a feeder that you should try to set up for blue jays Okay, so this feeder has a small mesh in it and is designed for finches, specifically for finches, and the food inside is for finch food. It's, it's a mixture of thistle and other small seeds that finches like. Um, so this will attract gold finches, house finches, and then pine siskins and other, other finch-like birds that would want to come on here. Now occasionally we get a woodpecker on here uh, or two, but for the most part it's just the finches. So this is a ground tray feeder and it's designed for birds that like to feed on or near the ground. Uh, birds like cardinals sometimes don't like to perch or don't like to cling. Um, a lot of the sparrows are ground feeders and want to be on the ground or near the ground. And this is a, a nice feeder to keep them on the ground and keep it clean. Um, this one we just fill up every morning with a little bit and they wipe it out because the squirrels get to this one as much as they want. So between the birds and the squirrels they wipe this out every day so I limit how much I just put a cup in every day and that's all they get. Okay, this is also an open tray feeder. This is a hanging one. Um, and again, some birds just don't like to cling or perch. They want to just kind of land flat, so cardinals would be a good one for this one. Um, also, the, the, the other birds will use it, but the cardinal is, like I said, like a more of a platform type feeder. Um, because it's open, I can't keep the squirrels off it so much, even with the baffle. So I use safflower seed, which the squirrels don't like so much. The safflower seed is liked by the cardinals and the nuthatches and the titmice, and they'll come and get it. But the, um, the, the squirrels don't like it so much. So I get the occasional squirrel that'll try it, but for the most part, they leave it alone and it's good for the birds. This feeder is designed to hold peanut pieces, which is attractive to a lot of birds, specifically woodpeckers, uh, nuthatches, and tip mice, and chickadees. They like this a lot. A lot of common winter birds. Um, and it's squirrel proof, which is, this is a feeder I really, really like. If the squirrel lands on its weight is so it falls down. It's made of heavy metal and it's a really good feeder um, it's, I, we had a big problem with squirrels eating all our peanuts on this style of feeder before and I wanted to offer peanut pieces to the birds because they seem to like it so much and we get so many different kinds of birds on this feeder. Um, when I found this feeder it was really great. It keeps the squirrels off and allows the birds to get the peanuts. It's a really great feeder for attracting a wide variety of, like I said, woodpeckers, chickadees, titmice, things like that. Okay, this is a suet feeder and suet is just fat that's been kind of rendered down and then re, uh, melt it into cakes or whatever and put it inside a, a feeder that the birds can get. It's really good for them. The high fat content is good for birds, especially in the winter when they need a lot of energy. So this is specifically designed for woodpeckers and this big one here is designed to accommodate a pileated woodpecker, which I'm hoping we're gonna get to see at our feeder here. We do have one in the area. He hasn't visited our feeders yet. Most suet feeders uh, that you can find come like this. They're very simple, nothing too fancy. Um, it just have, it held one suet cake that you can buy commercially, or you can even ma make your own suet cakes with molds. You showed us a lot of different feeders, all different varieties of seeds, shape sizes, but if you were a beginner, what's the one feeder that you should start with? Um, if I was just gonna have one feeder, I would probably use this, this tube style feeder with the black sunflower seed in it. Um, it'll check the widest variety of birds. It's relatively easy to maintain and um, like I said, it's a, it's a good starter feeder to get you going. Okay, so I have my bird feeder, I have my seed, but I'm still not getting a lot of birds. Is there anything else I can do to attract more birds into my yard? Yeah, habitat is very important for birds. They need to have places to hide, besides this place to hide, they also need food sources and places to nest. So planting native plants, plants that they're used to having around is very, very important. Planting native shrubs can not only give them seeds that they can eat later on in the year or berries, um, but also provide places to nest and, and provide food for caterpillars and things that the birds need when they're nesting as well. So having that good balance of native plants is really important to create that habitat to have birds around in your yard. Yeah, creating your own little like food web. Yeah, absolutely, awesome. absolutely. Keeping the feeders clean is very important because uh, you are attracting a large amount of birds and they, they can spread infection. So you want to clean them regularly, um, probably once every other week or so, scrub them down really good and drain them. Make sure they're dry. Dry is the main thing because the seed can get moldy if it's wet and get caked in. So you do want to take your feeders completely apart, scrub them down and soak them and then put them back out on a regular basis. Like I said, maybe twice a month, depending on how heavy the, you're going through seed. Also, you don't have to pack them up full. You don't want to just leave them out forever. You do want to be filling them every couple of days or so. If you just have a feeder that's totally full and you're leaving it sit out there for a month at a time, that seed is going to get bad and it's going to be bad for the birds and they're not even going to want to come to eat it. 
Thank you, Bob, for letting us help you feed the birds today. I hope this inspires you to put a feeder in your own backyard. And there's so many opportunities to get the whole family involved. You can do a bird challenge where you have a list and see who can get the most species. Or you can participate in a citizen scientist research program like eBird to record your findings. Or get artsy and start a nature journal and sketch the birds as they sneak in for some seed. Either way, I hope you enjoy having nature so close to home. And now, a moment of zen. How cute was that owl? Let's keep the cuteness going by checking in with the baby Blanding's turtles we're raising to help the state endangered species. Not only does the Forest Preserve District of Will County protect and enhance our natural lands and habitats, but we're also doing our part to help out a state endangered species. In 2017, the district joined a regional Blanding's Turtle Recovery Program. This program is spearheaded by our friends at the Forest Preserve District of DuPage County and overseen by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Today I'm here with Program Coordinator Jen Guest, who's going to walk us through everything it takes to raise these turtles. The overall goal of this program is to give these babies a head start. Once they're a little bit bigger, then we release them into the wild. So Jen, have you released any of these turtles? I have. We get them when they're just a few weeks old and we help raise them until they're about one year of age and we um, get to help put them back in the wild. And this is the first time they're going to be in the wild so it's really cool. We'll put on uh, waders, like chest waders, and we'll get to go right into the wetland with them and slowly put them in one, one at a time in different spaces. And you'll see them uh, swim for the first time in deep water or feel the sunlight or the natural uh, water in the wetlands. and. Sometimes you'll see them sink and you'll, you'll worry about them, but you'll see them pop up somewhere else later. Um, it's really cool to just set them free and know that they're going to have a chance to live in the wild. Since these turtles are destined for the wild, is this different than raising like a pet turtle? It is. I know I'm holding this turtle right now so you can get a better view, but we don't really handle our hatchlings very often. We pick them up to weigh them or put them in a container while we're cleaning their tank or to feed them. Otherwise, they don't get handled like pets do. They're not education animals like our adult blaming turtles we have at Isla Cache. Um, so we try not to handle them too much. They're on a very specific diet that will help them grow um, in order to be able to survive in the wild. When they get a little bit older, we'll start feeding them live food um, so that they get used to eating the things they're going to need to eat while they're in the wild. And how old are these right now? Uh, these are about four months old. Aww. So they started out the size of a quarter. Uh, not anyone can have a blanding turtle. These are state endangered species, so you have to have a special permit to have it. You also need to have the right conditions to raise these turtles because we want to make sure they survive to make it back into the wild. I notice on these numbers they're kind of like scuffing off, so this isn't permanent ink or anything on them, correct? It's not. And right now we, re we repaint them about every two weeks. Just with the natural being in the water and out of the water, and sometimes the turtles like climb on top of each other, the paint will scrape off naturally. And when they go back into the wild, when it's time to get released, we actually take a, a darker pen than this one and we cover back up over the numbers if they haven't worn off yet just to make sure they're camouflaged in the wild. So what we have is a non-toxic paint pen. Uh, we have number 146 out here. Her numbering is um, it's broken apart a little bit. It's kind of scuffed up. But also as the turtles grow, their big scales, their scoots start to spread apart. So the numbers start to spread apart too. So Susie is going to go ahead and take 146 out. So Susie has a turtle in her hand and what she's going to do is she's going to take the paint pen and she's going to trace the number that's already on there 
and make sure that it's all covered up and then we're gonna let it sit and dry for a little bit and then we'll come back and we'll trace over the number again. And as soon as the paint's dry, then we can put 146 back in the tank. We're gonna do a group feeding with the turtles that haven't eaten for the day. And what I'm gonna do is use this temperature gun to make sure that the water I get out of the sink is the same temperature as in their tank. You don't want the turtles to get shocked by a huge temperature difference because that makes them not feel very good. So we wanna keep the water temperature the same. So we're looking for somewhere between 79 and 80 degrees. And on here is a number for every turtle that we have. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure all the turtles eat and as they eat, we're gonna check off that they ate. The type of food today they're eating is a pellet mix. So we basically wanna make sure every turtle's eating. We also weigh them every two weeks to make sure that um, they're gaining weight. I like to set them on the basking rock here and that gives them the choice of whether they want to go in the water or not. Thank you, Jen, so much for showing us the turtles. I think we've all learned it takes a lot of work to keep these guys healthy. So if the public want to log more turtle time, how can they do that? Well, the first thing you can do is go to our website, which is reconnectwithnature.org. You can get updates on our visitor center hours, articles about turtles, and any programs we have that are turtle related. Thank you so much for joining us on this season of The Buzz. It's very appropriate that we started our journey at Lake Wenrick and we're ending it here as well. On this episode, we learned how the Forest Preserve helps these nesting birds here and also our backyard birds at our feeders, plus the state endangered Blanding's turtles. So now it's your turn. Map your next adventure at reconnectwithnature.org to find trail maps, program updates, and preserve information. I hope to see you hiking the trails, but until then, I'll see you on the next episode of The Buzz.